Uh, thanks for joining us again. Another one of our uh, Safer at Home series. Um, happy to have you with us tonight. Um, as you might realize, this is our last one for the calendar year 2020. And um, um, I hope you'll join me in saying that I'm really looking forward to 2021. Um, because, uh, 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 well, I, I think we all know how we feel about this this calendar year. So uh, um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, if I forget to uh, mention it, uh, a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah to everybody. Uh, I didn't want to forget to uh, leave that out. Uh, as you know, our talks are sponsored by Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union and Martha's Vineyard Savings. And all our books uh, in this series are available at Eight Cousins Bookseller in uh, Falmouth. So we hope you uh, um, patronize a small business and, and um, keep it local. Um, thrilled to have our speaker tonight, Susan Eisenhower. Um, she's an American consultant, author, expert on international security, um, the uh, chairman emerita of, um, of the Eisenhower Institute. And also I was thrilled to find out that uh, she is doing this from, uh, from Maine. She, uh, she, uh, <laughs> she, she, is, uh, um, she likes to spend some time in New England, so she's one of us. Uh, as you know, um, uh, when you got a question, use the chat feature. And uh, just as a little um, uh, amendment to, she sent me her PowerPoint, so I'm going to be her little uh, technical advisor. So if something goes wrong with the PowerPoint and ain't her, it's me. So, <laughs> just, uh, for, so would you welcome uh, Susan Eisenhower? Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to, first of all, express my gratitude to uh, Mark Schmidt for inviting me to this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak to you. I'm a great supporter of um, historic um, memory and um, archival and, and um, uh, historical societies, how important they are uh, for all of us in understanding uh, where we come from. Uh, secondly, Mark's absolutely right. I have to say I, I love New England. I've spent a fair amount of time in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact, but a number of years ago, I uh, bought a, um, <clears throat> uh, a small house in uh, Maine, and I come up here actually to get my head back together. Uh, but usually, um, I'm down in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, it's quite a city these days, as you can well imagine. And I just can't even begin to say uh, what a retreat um, uh, mentally and in every other way it's been uh, to be up here in New England, really where my heart is. Um, thirdly, uh, what a wonderful opportunity to speak to just before Christmas. And uh, Christmas is a very emotional time in the Eisenhower family. I'd like to just say very quickly that at Christmas time, uh, it was uh, both the period of um, my grandparents' um, greatest tragedies um, and also their greatest triumphs. Uh, in uh, their first uh, born son, Dow Dwight, uh, died uh, over the Christmas period. Uh, he had an infectious disease. It was called scarlet fever uh, and went to the hospital on Christmas Eve and died on uh, January 2nd. Uh, so that made this uh, holiday very uh, emotional, but my grandmother at some point decided that she could go through life uh, laughing or crying and uh, rightly opted uh, to, to uh, laugh. So years later, after the uh, pain of the passing of this boy had lightened a little, um, she would make Christmas uh, a time of uh, great celebration, largely so that she could lavish this not only on her family, uh, but on the many people who were part of uh, the Eisenhower um, family uh, in a larger sense. That would have been the uh, Secret Service men uh, and many of the people who were helping my grandparents in their post-presidency with the farm at Gettysburg. Uh, during the White House years, that's another subject. <laughs> Maybe I'll have some questions on it, but it was really quite a time. In the Triumph Ferry, it was over Christmas, for instance, that uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, was given the command to uh, be the supreme allied commander of, um, of uh, allied forces uh, for the invasion of Normandy uh, that took place later that June. Uh, it was always during the Christmas season that he got his uh, promotions. And, and so it's really uh, quite a remarkable time of the year. Well, um, 
I must say it was an emotional experience to write How I Cled. Um, and yet it's not a memoir. Um, it's not a biography. Um, it's not a uh, history. Uh, it's a little bit of all of those things. And my objective in writing it was to actually show how Ike led rather than what he led. Uh, we have so many uh, books today, um, especially that are constructed as a case study um, that you know might well um, show the various um, options available for um, making some decisions. Um, but in fact, um, Eisenhower brought a, a sort of a magical formula of um, the exertion of his own personality uh, together with a very um, self-disciplined uh, and organized way of decision making. So that's what this book is about. Having said that, uh, I promised my editor and myself that I would not write an 800 page book as so many of them are. I wanted to cover both his presidency, uh, but more importantly, uh, in that context, also the war years, because that would be the way to know Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the general, and Dwight Eisenhower, the president, was one and the same person. Um, and uh, that's often missed in the scholarly community because many scholars are e either gravitate more towards presidential history or others are more interested in World War II. Uh, so I tried to um, bring that together so that um, those who wrote about either end of his very long career uh, would understand that um, the process of how he went about making decisions uh, was the th same throughout his, his life. And I learned a lot when I uh, did the research on this, even though I actually know him very well. So um, I, tonight I just wanna say also that I'm fully compartmentalized. Um, in other words, there's no question uh, that I wouldn't be happy to take. Uh, and when I say fully compartmentalized, my parents, thanks mom and dad, uh, made sure that um, I was always able to think about my relationship with my grandfather as being separate from what he did um, as a general and a president. And that turned out to be very good, um, good training because there was a very, very long time after uh, Ike's presidency that uh, the historical community not only didn't get this man, um, but completely misinterpreted a lot of how I went about problem solving. Uh, I hope this book solves some of those mysteries. I know there have been some other splendid uh, books of research and, and a number of very, very fine uh, personal accounts, but I've tried to bring those together with what I knew. So this book turned out to be the first time I ever let that firewall down between uh, myself as a person and his career. And so on that point, as I um, say a few more things about um, uh, the, the man I knew and the man I learned about in my research, uh, I have to say that there was uh, no way to avoid uh, his public career as, as hard as my parents tried to help us um, create a framework uh, to think about it. Because I myself as a, um, as a young person had secret service protection um, and in, Eisenhower's uh, retirement years, uh, uh, we lived on a property adjacent to uh, my grandparents. Uh, and so you'll hear me bobbing and weaving. If I refer to uh, him as my grandfather tonight, you'll know I've got my family hat on. And if <laughs> you hear from me about um, Eisenhower, the uh, policymaker or the general, uh, it'll be General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. Uh, having said that, um, I did see little snippets in my childhood of where this public career, um, in an, from an intellectual and emotional standpoint, um, uh, flooded our lives, but very temporarily. Um, uh, a couple of funny examples. Um, when I was in eighth grade, my um, history teacher sent me home to um, ask Granddad a series of questions. And I'll tell you, uh, Granddad did not like that at all. Uh, he thought um, whenever his grandchildren were being used as a go-between that it was putting us in an awkward position, but anyway, he answered these questions. So I got to question four, which is why didn't you intervene in Hungary uh, during the Hungarian uprising? And by this time, um, Ike's 
rather legendary temper, though not one I saw much of, but we still know he had one. Uh, he began to boil hello. a little bit hello. and, cr and hello. hello, uh, and crossed his legs and said, what, and start World War III? Okay, well, uh, that certainly uh, was a real reminder of the kind of decisions he had to make during his presidency. Uh, I also had an opportunity as a school kid to ask him about a very large picture he had in an ante room at his office at Gettysburg College. Uh, and he told me um, in sixth grade ease uh, what the Battle of Normandy was all about. Um, and between that and meeting some of his wartime colleagues, because they came to the farm to visit um, Eisenhower, uh, we led a really perfectly normal childhood. I'm not sure my mother would agree with that, but she sure was uh, trying hard to give us uh, an ordinary upbringing. And uh, my father, who was also a military officer, had one way of describing it. You're not going to go around wearing the boss's stars. Okay, well, we got that... Uh, that principle down pretty clearly. Uh, there were many surprises I um, encountered in the course of my research. And um, it's a little bit surprising that uh, I didn't know more of some of these things, but I have to say that uh, the part of uh, my own professional life that I've worked in has been touched deeply by his legacy. And that is for 27 years of my career, I was traveling, um, rather intensively or certainly working intellectually intensely uh, on US-Soviet and then US-Russian relations. Uh, of course, Dwight Eisenhower was um, presiding over a very, very dangerous time uh, during the Cold War. And it was dangerous because uh, with the advent of um, nuclear weapons, um, first the atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb, which was so much more powerful, than the atomic bomb, that uh, there were really no rules of the game. And it was during the Eisenhower administration that uh, getting um, our national security apparatus together to think through what it really meant uh, to have these uh, weapons uh, was really um, a, an intellectual exercise and a diplomatic exercise that occurred during the Eisenhower years. Uh, I, I worked for many years in the arms control area, so I was coming across his legacy all the time. But again, I put his thinking about nuclear weapons and other things together with the things I used to hear at the dining room table. And so that's what you're going to find in this book. Um, let me say a few things about uh, the structure of the book, um, because I, I really did not want to write a book that only scholars would love to read. Um, this book is full of anecdotes. Uh, I tried to bring Dwight Eisenhower to life. And let me say a little bit about that life. Um, uh, I think the uh, closest thing I ever uh, read that really struck me about um, Eisenhower is, according to his 1915 yearbook, he was big as life and twice as natural. And boy, that was the case. So, um, uh, Mark, I'm wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind putting up the pictures now. And let's see a little bit about that life that he was bigger than. Um, <laughs> uh, Michael Cord, I don't know if you know who Michael Cord is. He's the legendary former uh, editor in chief of Simon and Schuster. And he did write a book on uh, Eisenhower and Hero. His book there is on Lawrence of Arabia, but a prolific writer himself. And uh, his review was very kind. Um, so maybe we have the next slide, please. Okay, well, this is a picture. Uh, how about that smile? He is talking to the 101st Airborne Division that is just about to take off for the beaches of Normandy, and I can say to unknown fates. Uh, only a week before this picture was taken, and this picture is taken, um, you know, later in the evening. You know, in, in Great Britain, uh, the, uh, the country stays uh, light till fairly e uh, late in the evening. So this is probably around uh, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, he's gone out to talk to the paratroopers. Uh, he tried to see during the war as many of the people who were under his command as possible. Uh, and it's, um, I've chosen this particular picture because of the empathetic, empathetic ways looking at these young men. 
he is looking these men in the eyes knowing that um, many of them would die that evening. Uh, and this is made even more, um, I think, poignant because his uh, Air Force commander, uh, who is in charge of the paratrooper uh, segment of the D-Day landing, had told General Eisenhower that by his estimates, because of uh, some changes in German positions, uh, they were likely to lose between 50 and 70 percent of these men that night. Uh, and Eisenhower had to make the excruciating decision to go ahead and use the paratroopers anyway. Uh, he took two hours to make that decision. He went into a room. He went through all of the strategic elements of what was um, <clears throat> central to the decision itself. Uh, and then he reviewed um, the role that these men had to play. And it, they were the linchpin of the operation, as it turned out, uh, because their drops behind Utah Beach and Omaha Beach uh, would enable um, the uh, clearing of a German-held causeway to enable people to get off the beaches, especially at Utah Beach. Uh, so this was a heart-rending decision, especially, as you may remember, uh, in light of a very dicey weather forecast that I should say, by the way, was not agreed upon uh, by the meteorological team. They gave their best estimate, but there was even some doubts about uh, um, the, um, the forecast that he had been given for decision-making purposes. So I, uh, there's something very moving about that. Uh, before he went out to see uh, those troops, looking them in the eye, he wrote a note um, to himself and possibly to uh, the news media indicating that if the invasion of uh, uh, the uh, coast of Normandy failed, that uh, he accepted full responsibility. Um, and as he said, if any blame attaches um, to the effort, it's mine and mine alone. So uh, perhaps we could have the next slide. So uh, by the way, I should say about that last uh, uh, photo, I, I call that chapter uh, accountability without caveats. Um, just in summary, um, it's really remarkable when you think that he took full and complete responsibility even for the weather forecast, um, and that took a lot of courage too. So here's a picture of Ike at Abilene High School, and I'm, um, he's got some of his uh, uh, fellow uh, members of the baseball team, but he's in the back row, and I guess as we all look at our screens, he is um, standing next to the person in a coat and tie in the right. And it's sort of fun to see him with a full head of hair and to see uh, how he was in relative height. Now, it, this picture makes him look very short. He was actually about six feet tall, but he was a phenomenal athlete. Um, he got recruited to play baseball professionally, which he declined to do, um, which was a good thing because uh, he would uh, not have been able to um, pursue a military career, um, but he was also, uh, and I, I was thinking about him over the weekend, he would have loved the Army-Navy football game. He, he loved that game so much, you know, being uh, in the class of 1915 that graduated from West Point. Uh, he played actually in the Army-Navy game himself, but uh, the reason he would have loved it, among other things, is that by 1955, when he had his heart attack, uh, at the end of his first term in office, um, his doctors forbade him from ever seeing the Army-Navy football game again in real time. Poor guy. What a terrible thing to do to somebody who enjoyed that game so much, but um, they were worried about um, blood pressure spikes. So there he is with his uh, baseball team, and that's sort of a setup to say one more thing about his childhood. Uh, he came from a uh, German-American um, community of um, <clears throat> River Brethren. They were a subset of uh, the Pennsylvania Mennonites who traveled to Kansas in 1870. And I say that only because um, one of the basic tenets of uh, the River Brethren um, were, uh, it was pacifism. Uh, so Dwight Eisenhower grew up in an ardently pacifist household and went on to defeat uh, Nazi Germany at the end of World War II. Okay, perhaps we could have the next slide. 
Ah, so this is a, this is a wonderful picture. I, I like this just to show what an enthusiastic campaign looks like. And of course, he really believed in uh, open motorcades. Uh, we'll have to look at that somewhat nostalgically because uh, certainly, um, you know, we will never see uh, a president of the United States um, facing the public uh, like this again. Uh, but anyway, uh, he comes back from the war as the victorious uh, Supreme Allied Commander. Um, and you may or may not know that um, America's strategy during World War II was to, um, was called Europe First, which was that the uh, uh, European theater was given uh, priority over the theater in the Far East, even though we were attacked by the Japanese. And the reason for that was, is that the thinking was, is that Hitler had to be eliminated first um, because he was the ringleader, you might say, of the other uh, Axis powers. Uh, so after this uh, victorious uh, moment on uh, Victory in Europe Day, and by the way, that was um, 75 years ago this last May, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, you know, he came back as literally um, a man with extraordinary name recognition and uh, enormous popularity. Um, I rather got a um, really a joy out of researching this part of the book because for six years, the Democrats and the Republicans tried to get him to run as president. And I don't know how many of you know that Harry Truman actually told Eisenhower twice uh, I've seen the letter, it's in my family's collection, um, offering to step down as president of the United States if Ike will run uh, as president in his place. Uh, that didn't happen. Ike eventually decided to um, run as a Republican. Um, uh, for, for one really interesting, well, for two really interesting reasons. The first being that Ike believed in the importance of a vibrant two-party system and the Republicans have been out of power <clears throat> since uh, 1926. So the last time a Republican president had been elected uh, was 20 years uh, before um, the period when Eisenhower finally decided to run. So I think he was very worried about the state of our democracy if we didn't have a vibrant two-party system. But even more uh, worrisome for him, I think, especially in that context, is that the Republicans led by Senator Robert Taft. He was known as Mr. Republican and was um, uh, the, uh, the son of a former president. He, he was an isolationist and, and the, uh, the preponderance of, uh, of opinion within the Republican party was to come home from the world after World War II. Now Ike as a military officer between the first war and the second war understood uh, that we would never be able to do that again, especially after World War II when quite literally 65 million people had perished and the United States uh, of America was the only country left standing. So Eisenhower uh, went to Senator Taft uh, as he set off to be the first commander of NATO forces in Europe. And just as General Eisenhower went to leave, he visited uh, with uh, Senator Taft and said, will you support NATO? And Taft said no. And then uh, Taft's view was well known. He hadn't supported the United Nations. He hadn't supported the Marshall Plan. Um, and that um, Taft's uh, position underscored for Eisenhower that the Republicans were going to remain an isolationist party. Uh, and, and so Ike decided to um, resign his commission in the United States Army um, and run for president. Okay, could we have another picture here, please? Well, I just put this up there because I wanted to see that wonderful smile. I, I don't know. I mean, this is the biggest life and twice as natural bit. He had, a, he had a, a fiery temper, according to his mother, and she said of her um, six surviving boys that he, of all of them, had the most to learn. Uh, in any case, he did learn that in spades, and I, I just, I love that picture, and I thought you might uh, get some kind of idea of what his appeal was like during that time. Next picture, please. Oh, I had to throw that in, because uh, <laughs> that's me. 
Um, but I wanted you just to see what a kind man looks like. He loved kids and he was extremely uh, attentive as a grandfather. I've got some pretty wild stories in that book about uh, getting into trouble and facing the music and a few other things as a kid. Um, but uh, just a really, um, a man with an extraordinarily sweet side to him. I mean, he um, uh, designed jewelry from my grandmother. Uh, I once uh, won a riding trophy because I rode his horses and uh, it was a tiny little cup and it disappeared. And three weeks later, um, I unwrapped something he left for me and it was my dinky little riding cup put on a pedestal. He had designed a pedestal for it. <laughs> okay, uh, let's have another picture here, please. Ah, so this is like the painter, and this is how he managed all the extraordinary stress, because as I said before, nuclear weapons had changed everything. And then, of course, we had uh, the civil rights movement uh, that culminated for the Eisenhower administration uh, with the imposition of the 101st Airborne Division in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, and the Airborne Division uh, was used to escort nine African-American children um, to their first day of school at Central High School. Uh, the governor of Arkansas, you may remember, uh, had refused to um, follow the um, instructions and the, the, the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education, uh, which was a civil rights um, measure um, adopted uh, in the Supreme Court. Eisenhower appointed uh, five judgeships during his time as president. Uh, none of them were white supremacists. Um, he did not allow um, consideration of anybody who had um, <clears throat> uh, segregationist views uh, on the court. Um, and you might be interested to know that in 1956, as a Republican, uh, he appointed um, Justice Br uh, William Brennan to the Supreme Court. Brennan was uh, a Democrat because Eisenhower believed that the um, court needed to be ideologically balanced. In any case, the painting served as a way for him to think through his decisions and to um, arrive at um, the conclusions he needed to make. So maybe we could have another picture or so here. Thank you very much. I've put this one um, together with the others just to show you um, how placid and calm um, his painting uh, was. You see over there DE at the bottom of the right hand side. Um, it says DE 1957. So this uh, painting is in my collection. And uh, when I finished researching the book, I was struck by the fact that what he was painting there, so, so placid, um, was occurring just when um, uh, several of the biggest crises of his presidency occurred. Uh, the first, of course, was um, the um, imposition of the 101st Airborne Division in Little Rock that September of 1957. In October, the launch of Sputnik, the Soviet Union's um, first artificial, mankind's first artificial satellite on orbit. Um, and, um, and then, of course, the um, forthcoming 1958 um, midterm elections. Um, a, uh, the beginning of a mild recession um, and the conclusion of a global pandemic, uh, this one on the Asian flu. So there's a lot going on in that painting and yet um, all of it is, um, you can tell, a kind of an effort to calm his inner self. So perhaps we could have another picture, please. I just, this is an Ike painting of Winston Churchill. I just put it there because I thought you might like to see how uh, he depicted um, uh, the late prime minister. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Eisenhower painted paintings for all of his wartime and many of his presidential associates. Uh, he even painted Prince Charles and Princess Anne for the Queen of England. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, well, I just want to point out who his counterpart was in the Soviet Union. This is Nikita Khrushchev, who um, <clears throat> became the, um, the, the premier of the Soviet Union um, mid to the latter part of the 1950s. For a long time, we didn't know who was in control of the Soviet Union because Joseph Stalin had died uh, six weeks after Eisenhower took the presidency. So if you can imagine uh, what it was like to take the helm 
uh, when uh, the Soviet Union's absolute leader, um, you know, uh, was deceased. And, and what that meant was there were all kinds of pitfalls and dangers, but there were also opportunities ahead. Uh, next picture, please. Well, I just wanted to show this picture very obviously for um, uh, to sort of wrap up my uh, presentation by saying um, that this is Ike uh, at D-Day plus 20 years. Uh, you have no idea, I mean it sincerely, what those men who are uh, behind him meant to him. And he was quite emotional about it. As a matter of fact, in 1952, uh, he went to a uh, an airborne division reunion and uh, somebody got up and gave a speech about the courage of Eisenhower's decision on D-Day, especially to use the airborne troops. And it brought Eisenhower to public tears. Uh, but anyway, there he is standing looking at these young men. He says on the wall there that they gave us another chance. And uh, as I reflect in my book, I mean, we we're given another chance. And the question is, what are we going to do with it? I mean, we still have time uh, to uh, remember those men in a way that um, is appropriate for the sacrifices they made. Uh, I think that uh, their loss in that war, I mean, he liberated order of the concentration camp and decided on the spot that everyone had to come chronicle it. It was under his orders uh, that the Holocaust today is as well, um, is as well illustrated and, and uh, archived as it is. Um, and um, he just knew that the world could never go through another war like that, or even the kind of war um, that was um, implied uh, by the possession of these terrible, dangerous nuclear weapons. Um, and then I think we have a final slide, don't we? Yes, there he is. Um, on his last, on the last birthday of his life. Um, I tell in my book a little story about going to visit him the day before this picture was taken. And um, I told him I was gonna bring him a birthday cake. And he said, um, well, you know, my doctor says I can't have any salt. He had had several heart attacks. And by this point, uh, his heart just was not functioning. Um, and uh, I think he knew he didn't have long to live. In any case, I, uh, so I uh, baked a cake and I got on a train from my school and went all the way down. But before doing so, my parents were overseas by this point um, and uh, I was in uh, boarding school uh, because of that. And uh, I took this cake uh, on a train to the hospital and I gave it to him. And I said, you know, I had to get permission to come here to bring you this cake today, granddad. And, and I said, and, and my English teacher, um, one of two African-American uh, teachers at my school told me that um, uh, his name was Isaac, but he was known as Ike, and that he shared the same birthday with you. That's what I told Grandin. And um, before I left to go back to my school, he whispered something to the nurse, and the nurse came out with a big white cake um, uh, that uh, had you know, some sporting equipment and other things. Obviously, it was a cake that had been given to my grandfather for his birthday. And he said, now I want you to take this cake back for Ike Green. Uh, and you tell him from one Ike to another, happy birthday for me. Okay, so I think those are our slides. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, questions. I've only hinted at some of the issues that are outlined in this book. I wanted to give you a little of that biographical um, overview because, um, you know, he was um, he was a man who um, he was a man of uh, deep belief. Uh, he always put his country first. He was a military man. He actually uh, made his vow to, uh, to defend the Constitution of the United States when he was 20 years old, and he never veered off that. But I can tell you, having shown you the last slide, that I was there for his deathbed wishes. Uh, he said a couple of things. Um, don't put me on a horse, which means that he, he didn't want to be memorialized uh, particularly. Um, uh, though the Eisenhower Memorial on the Washington Mall um, was dedicated in September of this year. 
Uh, but he did have one deathbed wish, and he said, get the archives open. Uh, he says, get the archives open. Uh, I want the American people to know what I did in their name. Um, whether they approve or disapprove of my decisions, they have a right to know. And my family and I have been working very hard um, ever since he passed to get as much declassified as possible. I think the Eisenhower Library is ahead of most other libraries for that really aggressive approach that we've taken in this memory. Uh, it's because his archives are open, however, that we've begun to see that Eisenhower's leadership was a very different brand of leadership. Uh, he had uh, uh, lots of tools in the strategist toolbox, um, and one of them was to work behind the scenes when he thought it would further his goals. So on that note, let me just uh, bring my uh, formal remarks to an end and invite questions. And uh, Mark, I'd be most grateful to you if you could um, help me <laughs> uh, with those, because I think you'll be on the receiving end of the, uh, the, the, the chat lines, right? Absolutely. Not, not a problem. And, and uh, as we mentioned before, if you got a question, uh, use the chat uh, and type it in there. And um, going back to your first, um, your first picture, the, the, that famous one of talking to the airborne troops, and we've, we've all seen it. They've got their, uh, their, their grease paint on. It's a night. And, and um, I think people may or may not know the backstory to it, but I think one of the things that, that always stuck with me about Eisenhower was his accountability. Like he, he, he literally looked these guys in the eye, where are you from, soldier? I'm from Missouri, sir. I'm from, I'm from Michigan, sir. And he had little anecdotes for each one of them. But, but also, uh, as you mentioned about having that letter, um, there's a story I think you tell in, the, in your book, and I know it's in, been in other books, where somebody wanted to, you know, the, 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 the British advisor said, don't, this is going to be a slaughter. He said, put your comments down in paper. That'd be, but then he said, we're going to go through this. And he put his, com his comments down on paper. So there would be a paper trail. I'm in charge here. If, the, if this goes wrong, it's on me. Right. And I always, I always I thought that was one of his important. great assets. <laughs> that, well, I think that's very important. He felt so strongly that he didn't want his subordinates to be held responsible for his decisions. You know, this whole idea of plausible deniability, he didn't like that at all. And um, uh, uh, Air Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, who was the person who recommended against dropping uh, the airborne uh, units, uh, was told by Eisenhower to please put his recommendations in writing so that if uh, Eisenhower decided uh, against that advice and the operation failed, he did not want Lee Mallory to be held responsible. He wanted to take the responsibility himself. And by the way, on that point about the airborne troops, that very, very famous picture, um, which I um, don't have, but it's in my book of Ike looking like he's giving uh, the 101st Airborne Division that big pep talk. It turns out that they were talking about fly fishing. Um, and when, I, when Ike ever went out to see the troops, he always wanted to talk to them about home. He believed that these guys were well-trained. They knew exactly what they were uh, about to go do. They were probably scared to death. So he tried to find touchstones that they could talk about that would remind uh, the troops who were about to take off uh, about the importance of living and surviving. And by the way, so, uh, the psychological approach you took into combat was tremendously important. There's a lot of literature on that. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful story. And I think that picture I showed tonight was, you know, uh, after uh, the fly fishing discussion, as a matter of fact, um, because it's the same unit. Uh, I noticed uh, the, uh, with, the, with the white hearts on their helmets. That's the uh, strike unit, the hearts strike unit. <laughs> okay. We got a question here. I grew up with Ike as president. I always respected his military career. I've read the book, Ike's Bluff, and like your thoughts on, on his always saying he was never sure about using the atomic bomb. In light of the fact he opposed the dropping of the bomb in Japan, how he got away with this. Also, how, how did he get along with, with General Patton? Ah, well, those are both great questions. Um, you know, it's really um, one thing that I think um, uh, served me well in this book is that I was exceedingly lucky in my... Um, early career in Washington, D.C., to um, meet a number of my grandfather's associates, including uh, General Andrew J. Goodpaster, who ended up becoming my mentor. And I'll, I'll tell you, 
there was nobody like uh, General um, Goodpaster except uh, perhaps my father and my grandfather. And, and he, General Goodpaster, worked for Dwight Eisenhower for um, uh, six years in the White House as his day-to-day -day national security person. Um, and I remember saying to him once, um, uh, I called, he called, told me to call him Andy. So Andy, do you think um, my grandfather would have used uh, a nuclear weapon? Um, and he sat there and he thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he said, no, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. I think um, uh, it was um, this sort of good cop, bad cop um, approach that Eisenhower took. And it's one reason he had um, uh, someone way more conservative than he was as Secretary of State because they were able to uh, key off of each other. Um, now, sometimes uh, John Foster Dulles was a little bit much to control, but uh, I had a pretty uh, crafty sense of how much uh, uh, guidance, how much he could actually delegate to people and to be able to trust the results. Uh, in any case, I think the answer to that, and I do address it in my book, is that he probably would not have, but I have General Good Pastor, uh, one of my grandfather's closest associates, to um, thank for that assessment. Also, his attorney general, um, Herbert Brownell, also said in his memoirs that he doubted it very much, too, um, especially based on the way he talked at um, cabinet meetings, which, by the way, were held once a week. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, how did he get along with George Patton? Well, you know, there's a wonderful moment um, Ike writes to Mamie um, at, at the end of the war while I think he was in the middle of the third or fourth Patton scandal of, of the war where Patton was talking, um, <clears throat> you know, um, indiscreetly. I think on that particular occasion, George Patton um, said that um, uh, the Nazis, after all, were, you know, uh, you know, kind of like our Democrats and Republicans or something. Well, that was after the war we'd just been through, that wasn't going to wash. So I wrote Mamie and said, Georgie, you see, they'd known each other since the early 20s. Georgie never loses an opportunity to keep his mouth shut. And then he said, he said, you know, that man's going to drive me to drink. <laughs> So, so my grandmother would have understood this because, you know, they had known uh, George, uh, George Patton for a very long time. And let me say one other thing, my father, who I was very close to, and we uh, both were, you know, writers of multiple books and the rest of it, but my father uh, grew up, of course, um, knowing uh, the Patton children because uh, Ike and George were together. So uh, my father was thrown together with the kids. And he said, oh my God, you can't believe it. He said, those Patton kids could, even at the age of 10, swear a blue streak. And whenever they started swearing, oh, General Patton would throw his head back and laugh, this big, huge laugh. <laughs> and my father, who was raised to report for duty, <laughs> thought that they, they were a remarkable family. <laughs> anyway, as we know, George, uh, George Patton, you know, was a very, very talented, you know, uh, a tank commander and, you know, I needed that talent at that time, even though uh, lots of headaches came with it. <laughs> um, how aware were you of McCarthyism and your grandfather's sense of this time in our history? Uh, well, um, I'm, let's see, I've got a birthday coming up, so I always like to be careful about, uh, uh, well, I'll just say it. I was born after the war, but uh, I was not, uh, uh, Joseph McCarthy was not my first political memory, we'll say that. Um, I'll tell you what was my first political memory was the swearing in in 1956, okay. But anyway, um, uh, I've got a chapter on McCarthy in my book, and I call it A Strategist Takes on a Demagogue. And I will thank you very much for that question because now I don't think there's any subject that is misunderstood as Eisenhower and McCarthy. Uh, and so it was a real pleasure for me to pull together um, <clears throat> a lot of the details, especially from Herbert Brownell's um, uh, memoirs. Uh, Herbert Brownell, again, was the uh, attorney general uh, during that time. And uh, was a very close observer all this. There are two things about the McCarthy period. First of all, Ike, because he was a successful general, was a genius at knowing what he controlled and what he didn't control. 
and he didn't like to mess around um, on things he couldn't control because he would use his other tools to go after the people who did possess the control. So you can see as a military man, right? You'd say, uh, what real estate are my troops occupying? And do I control that river? And do I control that highway? You see what I mean? That's the way his mind works. Um, and so Eisenhower did not control Joseph McCarthy. The Senate of the United States controlled Joseph McCarthy because we have um, a uh, three bran co-equal branches of the United States government. So Eisenhower's reasoning is if I don't control um, Senator McCarthy's fate, then I'm going to make sure I don't do anything that raises his popularity. And I'm going to go after the people privately who do control Senator McCarthy's fate. And that was his strategy. So, um, and I, it's hysterical. I, I, I hope um, some of you have a chance, if you're interested in this, have a chance to, to read the selection of quotations because everybody was furious at Ike for never mentioning Senator McCarthy's name, i.e. he would not take him on publicly. Why? Because the Republican leadership in the Senate of the United States supported Joseph McCarthy. And what he didn't want to do was to elevate McCarthy's standing by raising McCarthy to the presidential level. And in the meantime, offend uh, the people who would control McCarthy's fate. Um, and what he needed to do was to make sure that the people who controlled McCarthy's fate understood that McCarthy was a disaster, not just for uh, our nation, but also for the Republican Party. And that was, um, uh, that was ultimately um, a successful approach. But for one and a half years, Ike never mentioned Joseph McCarthy's name, did not mention it after he was inaugurated as president, did not mention it, and it drove McCarthy crazy. Uh, and finally, um, inducing McCarthy to pick a fight with the United States Army, and then Ike was on, uh, was, was on territory he well understood. So um, I hope, I hope uh, uh, that uh, that chapter adds something to the way we think about uh, Eisenhower's approach on that. You talk in your book about the fact that your grandfather, and other people have as well, was, for lack of a better word, a centrist. You you mentioned about um, in, that he he appoints a Democrat to uh, to the Supreme Court. That uh, um, he runs as a Republican because Republicans hadn't been in power. Um, some people criticized him for 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 that, but but you also said that um, that that was effective. Uh, explain how he how he operated and although okay well that's I'm, I'm so glad thank you for that um that comment first of all i think the important thing to know is that the middle way um was quintessentially eisenhower anyway um i mean look at look at what um what service he he rendered to the allied effort during world war ii he was spending the whole time comprising differences um, serving as the mediator, and then being the guy who made the decisions after he got his team on the same page. And that's exactly the philosophy he took with him into the White House. He called his two-term presidency the middle way, because his idea was is the middle way was this sort of broad highway where we could bring people on both sides of it together uh, to compose differences and to find compromise. Now, back in those days, compromise was not a dirty word. Um, it was actually a concept that was um, elevated because of World War II. Um, the book I want to read, if I don't write it myself, is how many compromises we made during World War II that actually assured victory. Um, and if we had not compromised with the British, we would not have been able to keep the alliance afloat. So all of this comes naturally to Eisenhower, whether other people appreciate it or not. Now, the fun thing, um, and um, actually there was another part of my book I really enjoyed writing, and that is um, Ike's relationship with the Republican Party. Because remember, he's the outlier here. He has no political base. So Dwight Eisenhower has nobody to answer to, not his own state because he was an army guy. Um, and um, he hadn't even voted in an election until 1948 because in those days, army officers 
um, did not vote in elections because they were serving the country as a whole. So um, he gets there, he starts having a lot of problems with the Republican Party um, that he was now leading. And um, uh, some of the problems were um, so aggravating because as I say, they were an isolationist party um, that at one point uh, in his first term, he actually considers leaving the Republican Party as president of the United States and, and starting a third party. Now, I just yesterday um, predicted to somebody that we would start having that conversation in this country about whether either one of these parties is gonna end up splitting because of the tremendous pressures, divisions within the political parties themselves. So um, I was amused that somebody was suggesting that the Republican Party should split off at this point. And uh, I was amused only because um, Eisenhower went through that whole thinking process in the 1950s. And so, um, yes, uh, his concept though, then just to wrap this up, is that um, he believed in what I, I, I call sustainable strategy. Uh, none of this, uh, we've got a new president in who's gonna overturn everything that the previous president did, and it's gonna go on like this into the future. I'm worried about that. Um, no, he, he wanted to compose the differences and make, um, make progress bringing everybody along at the same time. That's what a certain kind of, you know, the great leaders who are the doers as opposed to the sayers uh, do. You don't win a war by, you know, um, getting a prize for rhetorical skill. You win a war by bringing everybody along with you. So uh, I think it is rather remarkable. I didn't realize the statistic until I researched the book. Uh, that with uh, the Democrats in power in Congress for six of his eight years, he passed 80% of his legislative agenda. A question here. Uh, I know Ike advised Kennedy against both the Cuba invasion and the Vietnam War. Did you hear him express his disappointment with Kennedy ignoring his advice? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I never heard him complain about anybody like that privately. And I spent a lot of time with them. Um, I, I just have to say in the sort of funny story side, and I'll try and make this real quick, but uh, I was sitting on the uh, sun porch at Gettysburg with him one Sunday morning while he was watching the TV. You know, he had actually, even in those days, they had uh, remotes, you know, it was a huge thing, but he clicked through the channels and he stops uh, on Meet the Press or something. And there's uh, Governor Mark Hatfield from Oregon. And, uh, you know, as, a, as um, uh, Hatfield was being uh, questioned by the press, I, I noticed Granddad leaning closer and closer to the television. He scoots his chair up, you know, because there's noise in the room and the rest of him's listening very carefully. Afterwards, he um, turned off the TV. He went over to the telephone and called CBS uh, and said, I'd like to uh, speak to Governor Hatfield, please. And I'm sitting there in the chair thinking, wow, you know that guy who was just on TV? <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, it turns out that, uh, yes, indeed, um, um, Senator Hatfield later confirmed to me that, yes, uh, Dwight Eisenhower had called him. And, um, and so that was the sort of thing I heard him doing, always um, calling people and congratulating them on things and giving them positive reinforcement. You know. Um, uh, Hatfield was one of those guys who was, uh, by today's standard, a very liberal Republican. Um, I didn't hear anything about the Kennedy period, but I do uh, remember the Cuban Missile Crisis well. My father, who was an army officer who had served um, uh, during World War II uh, in Europe and uh, was later um, in a, a very uh, tricky combat unit in Korea. Uh, I remember him leaning closer to the television and saying, uh, I may end up uh, uh, being deployed to go back into uh, combat. Um, and so it was a very, very tense time. But you know, um, Granddad never felt the need to a, uh, first of all, my grandma was pretty insistent that he not bring his work home because she knew he needed to have a laugh and he was uh, compartmentalized himself enough uh, to, you know, be able to um, uh, use delegation very effectively. I think uh, General Goodpaster told me that Goodpaster said to him once, it must take a lot of guts 
um, to uh, delegate. And uh, Eisenhower then quoted uh, Clausewitz, um, you know, the great German strategist who said um, that centralization uh, is the impulse of fear. Um, and so he had these great associates around him and uh, he did not have to bring that work home. Um, but having said that, and I know this is a long-winded way to get to your point, I never heard anything negative said in the uh, Eisenhower household at all around the dining room table. Who knows what, you know, um, and then I'm telling you, he was shattered by Kennedy's death. I mean, he just couldn't believe it. And then uh, I could tell he was beginning to worry about uh, what was going to come to pass in this country if we didn't, you know, um, you know, I, I don't know. I just remember that so well. And uh, I'm actually uh, referring to other things. I think he worried a lot about this country during the late 60s because uh, we did not find a constructive voice for moving forward on civil rights, which he deeply believed in. And, and, and Mark, if you'll indulge me for one more comment here. Um, I was shocked and surprised and thrilled to see that um, after the Democrats uh, had not given Eisenhower the voting rights, se rights section he wanted in the first piece of legislation since uh, Reconstruction, that's the 1957 Civil Rights Act that Eisenhower promoted, uh, he was still a big enough man to call John Kennedy and tell him uh, that he would support um, the Democrats' civil rights bill and that he would lobby his own party to make sure uh, that the Republicans did not stand in the way of uh, passage of the voting rights. And furthermore, he told Barry Goldwater that if Barry Goldwater didn't get, get with the program, he would vote for Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> wow, I thought that was pretty good. So he knew how to, um, you know, um, make his presence known when the time came. Um, but I think that I hope has given you some idea of what a positive character he was and, and not one, he understood the burdens of power and, uh, and was not a partisan, was not a political partisan. So uh, later though, I will end by saying, I think he felt very sad that he got, well, I felt very sad that he got attacked the way he did um, for what was really as close to nonpartisan stewardship that we, this country has seen since uh, uh, maybe George Washington, you know. Um, and um, I'm not putting the two of them in the same category. I'm just saying they were both military men who did not have political parties um, that uh, they were associated with. Um, but now with the archives open, uh, I think there's a much better understanding of who he was as a person. And um, he only wanted to wish everyone who strives for this country well, because it's a, it's a complicated country and, uh, or it's a great country. Oh, I'll indulge you. I'm, in, I'm loving this. You, 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 <laughs> you go girl. Um, uh, how did he feel about his vice president and how do you think he would have felt about being related by marriage to Nixon? Well, that's okay. So um, two things here. Um, he uh, was aware of um, my brother's marriage to Julie Nixon. Uh, he stayed alive long enough to uh, watch the wedding on closed circuit television. Somebody organized that for him, which was an enormous act of kindness, just because whenever your grandchildren get married, you want to you want to be there for that anyway. But he died not long after that. Uh, their wedding was in December and he died in March. Um, so he was uh, already uh, on his way out. Um, uh, how did he feel about uh, his vice president? That is really the $64 million question because he didn't, I mean, I never heard him, I never heard him say. Um, and I um, have, uh, there've been a number of uh, issues in that vein that have cropped up in various family settings, not all of them, you know, directly related to my immediate family, because this is my brother who married Julie Nixon. Um, but they all, everybody's got a different theory about this. 
And I think this is very uh, typical of Ike. Um, when he had reservations in people, he tended to talk to that person about his reservations. But he wasn't the kind of person who'd go around, you know, complaining about people privately and denigrating anybody. So I think that's sort of like, uh, would he have used nuclear weapons? Um, I, I would say that uh, some of his associates didn't like Richard Nixon at all. Uh, others admired him. Um, and so I think uh, without attaching Dwight Eisenhower's thinking to this, I would say it'd be fair to say um, that Nixon was a, a controversial character in many ways, even before his own presidency. But he was uh, a progressive Republican, without any question, um, and uh, was a person who did much for the environment and uh, you know, and uh, the opening to China and many other things. So um, I really wish I could answer that question because I'm asked it a lot. And honestly, um, please believe me when I tell you I'm not hedging any bets here. Um, I can just tell you that I heard it coming from all sides. So um, the more uh, interesting thing would be what was what was uh, Brother David's uh, sister's reaction when he came home with Julie? <laughs> and all I could say was, um, uh, okay, well, you're going back to the White House, you know, and you're going to have Secret Service again, you know, have fun. We all remember how much fun that was, right? <laughs> no, no, she's, uh, they're a great couple. They're still married. They've got uh, a bevy of grandchildren, and um, uh, they're just remarkable, the two of them. That's all I can say, and they've made it work. Um, here's, here's something that had to be one of your granddad's most proud achievements. Can you comment on the inception of the interstate highway system? Right. Well, uh, the interstate highway system, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, um, it amuses me when I think about it, not because there's anything funny about it. I mean, what would we do without the interstate highway system, especially since uh, most of us uh, really don't want to get on an airplane terribly these days. So I've been uh, lauding the interstate highway system between Washington, D.C. and uh, uh, Cumberland County, Maine, since uh, I got up here. Um, the interstate highway system um, was a great example of uh, bipartisanship. As a matter of fact, uh, Ike gave the first pen on the signing of the interstate highway system uh, to uh, Albert Gore Sr. Uh, for the enormous cooperation the Democrats gave him in Congress, but it was his initiative. And uh, he had had an experience in 1919 where he was deployed with the United States Army to, to cross the United States to check out the roadways, uh, you know, in case of attack or mobilization or something. Um, and it took them from, um, it took them about uh, almost two, two months, almost two months to cross the country. Um, uh, 300 bridges collapsed. I don't know, all the figures are in the book, but it's just amazing. It was, uh, it was, um, a mess the whole way. They couldn't go much faster than about 25 miles an hour in certain places because of muddy roads and this and that. Uh, but there was um, um, Route 30, uh, which was sort of the backbone of this trip across the country. Anyway, he uh, wrote about it with great um, amusement and verve in, in um, one of his memoirs called At Ease, stories I tell to friends. Um, and then he, World War II comes around, and uh, this is really amazing. This is when he sees what a modern highway will do for defense preparedness, and by the way, even uh, the building of a strong economy. Um, you, nobody's ever called it this, but you could at least say that during the Battle of the Bulge, um, you, could, you could argue that that was the battle for the Audubon highway system in Germany. Because whoever got onto that highway system could move men and materiel at really rapid pace. Uh, so he came back during the 1950s. Um, part of his job as president in those years was for the modernization of America. Uh, again, if you think of it, there was no um, Federal Aviation Administration to um, organize the skies. All of that started during his time, including the founding of NASA and other uh, organizational modes, health, education, welfare, uh, that agency started in his administration, small business administration. All of this is post-war modernization time. Um, and he didn't see how we were going to build a modern country without an interstate highway system. 
Okay. I can't let you go without you, you telling everyone what you, you told me before we got on and that the, uh, this is not the first pandemic that the Eisenhower family has gone through. Um, tell yeah. people, people some of that. I mean, well, you know, I had no idea when uh, the, the, the regrettable thing for most writers is that there's such a long period of time in production because everybody wants to rewrite uh, at least one chapter or to put a completely different epilogue on the end of it. And I was deprived of both because my book was in production before this uh, pandemic year. Um, I would have loved to have had a chapter on Dwight Eisenhower and, um, and pandemics because um, he certainly um, presided over two of them. Uh, the first, when I say preside, he didn't um, at the uh, highest leadership level in 1918, uh, but at the age of 27, he was given command of um, the first uh, tank training corps at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was called Camp Colt. And you remember George Patton and Dwight Eisenhower were the two main tank guys in the army. George Patton went to the front, Dwight Eisenhower uh, was commanding uh, Camp Colt to train other um, tank troops uh, to uh, uh, go to the front. Um, he started out with 500 people um, in the um, uh, in late 1917. And uh, about four months later, he had 10,000 men under his command. Remember, he's 27 years old. And then that September, two officers came down from New York um, and uh, with their suitcases, they brought the Spanish flu influenza and it just tore through the camp. Um, this was the kind of flu um, where you died very quickly. Um, you could die, you could get infected and be dead in two days. And it seemed to attack especially younger people. Um, and so um, he, had, he had to manage that pandemic, uh, not just internally at the camp, uh, but also for the town of Gettysburg because he needed uh, the, the town was already terrified to have 10,000 rambunctious, um, frustrated, uh, anxious men on their uh, periphery. Um, but when the pandemic starts, they're also now terrified they're going to get infected. And Eisenhower had to use his diplomatic skills uh, to get the churches to open up their basements and to re-fashion uh, a, uh, a number of places in downtown Gettysburg. Um, so that uh, they could use these facilities for, um, you might say, pandemic management. Um, and then, you know, some of the troops rebelled. It was, uh, some of them wouldn't follow orders. Oh my gosh, it sounds like, so much like today. Um, <laughs> and um, so, but finally, uh, he not only managed to get his uh, troops off to Europe, uh, he managed to bring um, the pandemic on that camp um, to a successful end. Um, meaning that uh, they lost about 157 men, I think, which was a way lower number than most other army bases in the United States. And uh, then he was about to deploy for the front in World War I when the armistice was signed. In any case, I think the point was is that this is when Dwight Eisenhower comes to the attention of the United States Army for the first time. I mean, as a bureaucracy, because um, his doctors who advised him at Camp Colt went on to write the regs for best practices in pandemic management. Uh, and Eisenhower was given the Distinguished Service Medal at the age of 28 uh, for both the training and the pandemic management. And then let me just end by saying 1957-1958 uh, was this Asian flu uh, problem. And it isn't anything as uh, comprehensive or as challenging I'm guessing, than what we've got now. Um, but, you know, infectious disease was something that people lived with in those days. And as I said, their first son, uh, who would be my uncle, um, uh, died of scarlet fever at the age of three. Well, I want to I want to thank you for doing this tonight. Somebody wrote in our comments that um, you have your grandmother's beauty and your granddad's smile. Thank you for oh. your comments. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Well, listen, I just want to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And um, um, somebody uh, uh, said to me something absolutely wonderful, and he's sitting right in front of you. This is a year we must remember to forget. 
And uh, thank you, Mark, for that wonderful uh, phrase. I'm going to be thinking about. Uh, I'm going to be thinking about that on December 31st. All right. Well, I want to <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you for doing this tonight. I, this has yeah. been a great pleasure, a great honor. Um, continued good luck with this book. Uh, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. Enjoy Cumberland County. Um, <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Good luck, and uh, good night. Good night. Take care. Stay safe, everybody.